Chapter 1, Language and Learning, Page 7, Why Bilinguals Are Smarter. Speaking two languages rather than just one has obvious practical benefits in an increasingly globalized world. But in recent years, scientists have begun to show that the advantages of bilingualism are even more fundamental than being able to converse with a wider range of people. Being bilingual, it turns out, makes you smarter. It can have a profound effect on your brain, improving cognitive skills not related to language and even shielding against dementia in old age. This view of bilingualism is remarkably different from the understanding of bilingualism through much of the 20th century. Researchers, educators, and policymakers long considered a second language to be an interference, cognitively speaking, that hindered a child's academic and intellectual development. They were not wrong about the interference. There is ample evidence that in a bilingual's brain, both language systems are active even when he is using only one language, thus creating situations in which one system obstructs the other. But this interference, researchers are finding out, isn't so much a handicap as a blessing in disguise. It forces the brain to resolve internal conflict, giving the mind a workout that strengthens its cognitive muscles. Bilinguals, for instance, seem to be more adept than monolinguals at solving certain kinds of mental puzzles. In a 2004 study by the psychologists Ellen Bialystok and Michelle Martin Ree, bilingual and monolingual preschoolers were asked to sort blue circles and red squares presented on a computer screen into two digital bins, one marked with a blue square and the other marked with a red circle. In the first task, the children had to sort the shapes by color, placing blue circles in the bin marked with the blue square and red squares in the bin marked with the red circle. Both groups did this with comparable ease. Next, the children were asked to sort by shape, which was more challenging because it required placing the images in a bin marked with a conflicting color. The bilinguals were quicker at performing this task. The collective evidence from a number of such studies suggests that the bilingual experience improves the brain's so-called executive function, a command system that directs the attention processes that we use for planning, solving problems, and performing various other mentally demanding tasks. These processes include ignoring distractions to stay focused, switching attention willfully from one thing to another, and holding information in mind, like remembering a sequence of directions while driving. Why does the tussle between two simultaneously active language systems improve these aspects of cognition? Until recently, researchers thought the bilingual advantage stemmed primarily from an ability for inhibition that was honed by the exercise of suppressing one language system. This suppression, it was thought, would help train the bilingual mind to ignore distractions in other contexts. But that explanation increasingly appears to be inadequate, since studies have shown that bilinguals perform better than monolinguals, even at tasks that do not require inhibition, like threading a line through an ascending series of numbers scattered randomly on a page. The key difference between bilinguals and monolinguals may be more basic. Heightened ability to monitor the environment. Bilinguals have to switch languages quite often. You may talk to your father in one language and to your mother in another language, says Albert Costa, a researcher at the University of Pompeu Fabra in Spain. It requires keeping track of changes around you in the same way that we monitor our surroundings when driving. In a study comparing German-Italian bilinguals with Italian monolinguals on monitoring tasks, Mr. Costa and his colleagues found that the bilingual subjects not only performed better, but they also did so with less activity in parts of the brain involved in monitoring, indicating that they were more efficient at it. The bilingual experience appears to influence the brain from infancy to old age, and there is reason to believe that it may also apply to those who learn a second language later in life.
bilingualism's effects also extend into the twilight years. In a recent study of 44 elderly Spanish-English bilinguals, scientists led by the neuropsychologist Tamar Golan of the University of California, San Diego, found that individuals with a higher degree of bilingualism were more resistant than others to the onset of dementia and other symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. The higher the degree of bilingualism, the later the age of onset. Nobody ever doubted the power of language, but who would have imagined that the words we hear and the sentences we speak might be leaving such a deep imprint? Page 17. Speaking up in class, silently, using social media. Wasn't it just the other day that teachers confiscated cell phones and principals warned about oversharing on MySpace? Now, Aaron Olson, an English teacher in Sioux Rapids, Iowa, is among a small but growing cadre of educators trying to exploit Twitter-like technology to enhance classroom discussion. Last Friday, as some of her 11th graders read aloud from a poem called To the Lady, which ponders why bystanders do not intervene to stop injustice, others kept up a running commentary on their laptops. The poet says that people cried out and tried, but nothing was done, one student typed, her words posted in cyberspace. She is giving raw proof, another student offered, that we are slaves to our society. Instead of being a distraction, an electronic version of note passing, the chatter echoed and fed into the main discourse, said Mrs. Olson, who monitored the stream and tried to absorb it into the lesson. She and others say social media, once kept outside the school door, can entice students who rarely raise a hand to express themselves via a medium they find as natural as breathing. When we have class discussions, I don't really feel the need to speak up or anything, said one of her students, Justin Lansink, 17. When you type something down, it's a lot easier to say what I feel. With Twitter and other microblogging platforms, teachers from elementary schools to universities are setting up what is known as a back channel in their classes. The real-time digital streams allow students to comment, pose questions answered either by one another or the teacher, and shed inhibitions about voicing opinions. Perhaps most importantly, if they are texting on task, they are less likely to be texting about something else. Nicholas Provenzano, an English teacher at Gross Point South High School, outside Detroit, said that in a class of 30, only about 12 usually carried the conversation, but that eight more might pipe up on a back channel. Another eight kids entering a discussion is huge, he noted. Skeptics, and at this stage they far outnumber enthusiasts, fear introducing back channels into classrooms will distract students and teachers and lead to off-topic, inappropriate, or even bullying remarks. A national survey released last month found that 2% of college faculty members had used Twitter in class, and nearly half thought that doing so would negatively affect learning. When Derek Bruff, a math lecturer and assistant director of the Center for Teaching at Vanderbilt University, suggests fellow professors try back channels, most look at me like I'm coming from another planet, he said. The word on the street about laptops in class, Dr. Bruff added, is that students use them to tune out, checking email or shopping. He said professors could reduce such activity by giving students something class-related to do on their mobile devices. Besides Twitter, teachers have turned to other platforms for back channel, some with more structure and privacy. Most are free on the web and, so far, free of advertising. 
Google Moderator lets a class type questions and vote for the ones they would most like answered. Today's Meet, used by Mrs. Olson, sets up a virtual room. Purdue University in Indiana developed its own back channel system, Hot Seat, two years ago, at a cost of $84,000. It lets students post comments and questions, which can be read on laptops or smartphones or projected on a large screen. Sugato Chakravarti, who lectures about personal finance, pauses to answer those that have been voted up by his audience. Before Hot Seat, I could never get people to speak up, Professor Chakravarti said. Everybody's intimidated. It's clear to me, he added, that absent this kind of social media interaction, there are things students think about that normally they'd never say. But the technology has been slow to win over faculty. It was used in just 12 courses this spring. Sandra Sidner Busso, a professor of hospitality and tourism management, said Hot Seat did not mesh well with her style of walking around class to encourage a dialogue. The last thing I want to do is to give them yet another way to distract themselves. In high schools and elementary schools, teachers try to exercise tight control over back channels, often reviewing a transcript after class for inappropriate remarks. Even schools that encourage students to use mobile devices prohibit gossip during class. The 11th graders in Mrs. Olson's class said the back channel had widened their appreciation of one another. Everybody is heard in our class, said Leah Postman, 17. Janae Smith, also 17, said, It's made me see my peers as more intelligent seeing their thought process and begin to understand them on a deeper level. Chapter 2, Danger and Daring, page 31. Into Thin Air. Straddling the top of the world, one foot in China and the other in Nepal, I cleared the ice from my oxygen mask, hunched a shoulder against the wind, and stared absently down at the vastness of Tibet. I understood on some dim, detached level that the sweep of earth beneath my feet was a spectacular sight. I'd fantasized about this moment and the release of emotion that would accompany it for many months. But now that I was finally here, actually standing on the summit of Mount Everest, I just couldn't summon the energy to care. It was early in the afternoon of May 10, 1996. I hadn't slept in 57 hours. The only food I'd been able to force down over the preceding three days was a bowl of ramen soup and a handful of peanut M&Ms. Weeks of violent coughing had left me with two separated ribs that made ordinary breathing an excruciating trial. At 29,028 feet up, so little oxygen was reaching my brain that my mental capacity was that of a slow child. I was incapable of feeling much of anything except cold and tired. I'd arrived on the summit a few minutes after Anatoly Bukriv, a Russian climbing guide, and just ahead of Andy Harris, a guide on the New Zealand-based team to which I belonged. I snapped four quick photos of Harris and Bukriv striking summit poses, then turned and headed down. My watch read 1.17 p.m. All told, I'd spent less than five minutes on the roof of the world. A moment later, I paused to take another photo. Training my lens on a pair of climbers approaching the summit, I noticed something that until that moment had escaped my attention. To the south, where the sky had been perfectly clear just an hour earlier, a blanket of clouds now hid Pumori, Amadablam, and the other lesser peaks surrounding Everest. Later, after six bodies had been located, after a search for two others had been abandoned, after surgeons had amputated the gangrenous right hand of my teammate Beck Weathers, people would ask why, if the weather had begun to deteriorate, had climbers not heeded the signs. Why did veteran Himalayan guides keep moving upward, ushering a gaggle of amateurs, each of whom had paid as much as $65,000, into an apparent death trap? Nobody can speak for the leaders of the two guided groups involved because both men are dead, but I can attest that nothing I saw early on the afternoon of May 10th suggested that a murderous storm was bearing down. 
To my oxygen-depleted mind, the clouds drifting up the Grand Valley looked innocuous, wispy, insubstantial. As Krakauer began his descent from the summit of Mount Everest, he became extremely concerned because his oxygen tanks were running low. He knew he had to climb down to the South Summit Camp to get oxygen. On his way down, however, he ran into a traffic jam of more than a dozen climbers trying to reach the summit. He stepped aside to let them pass. The traffic jam was comprised of climbers from three expeditions. Moving at the snail's pace that is the norm above 26,000 feet, the throng labored up the Hillary step one by one, while I nervously bided my time. Harris, who'd left the summit shortly after I did, soon pulled up behind me. Wanting to conserve whatever oxygen remained in my tank, I asked him to reach inside my backpack and turn off the valve of my regulator, which he did. For the next 10 minutes, I felt surprisingly good. My head cleared. I actually seemed less tired than I had with the gas turned on. Then, abruptly, I sensed that I was suffocating. My vision dimmed and my head began to spin. I was on the brink of losing consciousness. Instead of turning my oxygen off, Harris had mistakenly cranked the valve open to full flow, draining the tank. I'd just squandered the last of my gas going nowhere. There was another tank waiting for me at the south summit, 250 feet below, but to get there, I would have to descend to exposed terrain on the entire route without the benefit of supplemental oxygen. And first, I had to wait for the mob to disperse. I removed my now useless mask and hunkered on the ridge. As I exchanged banal congratulations with the climbers filing past, inwardly, I was frantic. Hurry it up, hurry it up, I silently pleaded. The climbers, many of them exhausted, passed Krakauer on their way to the summit. They were behind schedule. After they passed, Krakauer continued his descent to the south summit. It was after three o'clock when I made it down to the south summit. By now, tendrils of mist were lapping at Everest's summit pyramid. No longer did the weather look so benign. I grabbed a fresh oxygen cylinder, jammed it onto my regulator, and hurried down into the gathering cloud. Moments after I dropped below the south summit, it began to snow lightly, and visibility went to hell. 400 vertical feet above, where the summit was still washed in bright sunlight, my compadres dallied, unfurling flags and snapping photos, using up precious ticks of the clock. None of them imagined that a horrible ordeal was drawing nigh. Nobody suspected that by the end of that long day, every minute would count. Nine climbers from four expeditions, many of those whom Krakauer passed on his way down from the summit, perished in that unexpected storm on Mount Everest on May 10, 1996. Impaired judgment seems to have been a significant factor in their deaths. Page 40. The World We Lost. In order to round out my study of wolf family life, I needed to know what the den was like inside, how deep it was, the diameter of the passage, the presence, if any, of a nest at the end of the burrow, and such related information. For obvious reasons, I had not been able to make the investigation while the den was occupied, and since that time I had been too busy with other work to get around to it. Now, with time running out, I was in a hurry. I trotted across country toward the den, and I was within half a mile of it when there was a thunderous roar behind me. It was so loud and unexpected that I involuntarily flung myself down. The Norseman came over at about 50 feet. As it roared past, the plane waggled its wings, then lifted to skim the crest of the wolf esker, sending a blast of sand down the slope. I picked myself up and quieted my thumping heart, thinking black thoughts about the humorist in the now rapidly vanishing aircraft. The den ridge was, as I had expected, wolfless. Reaching the entrance to the burrow, I shed my heavy trousers, tunic, and sweater, and taking a flashlight whose batteries were very nearly dead and measuring tape from my pack, I began the difficult task of wiggling down the entrance tunnel. The flashlight was so dim it cast only an orange glow, barely sufficient to enable me to read the marks on the measuring tape. I squirmed onward, descending at a 45-degree angle for about eight feet. My mouth and eyes were soon full of sand, and I was beginning to suffer from claustrophobia, for the tunnel was just big enough to admit me. At the eight-foot mark, the tunnel took a sharp upward bend and swung to the left. I pointed the torch in the new direction and pressed the switch. Four green lights in the murk ahead reflected back the dim torch beam. I froze where I was while my startled brain tried to digest the information that at least two wolves were with me in the den. 
Despite my close familiarity with the Wolf family, this was the kind of situation where irrational but deeply ingrained prejudices completely overmaster reason and experience. To be honest, I was so frightened that paralysis gripped me. I had no weapon of any sort, and in my awkward posture, I could barely have gotten one hand free. It seemed inevitable that the wolves would attack me, for even a gopher will make a fierce defense when he is cornered in his den. The wolves did not even growl. Save for the two faintly glowing pairs of eyes, they might not have been there at all. The paralysis began to ease, and though it was a cold day, sweat broke out all over my body. In a fit of blind bravado, I shoved the torch forward. It gave just sufficient light for me to recognize Angeline and one of the pups. They were scrunched hard against the back wall of the den, and they were as motionless as death. The shock was wearing off by this time, and the instinct for self-preservation was regaining command. As quickly as I could, I began wiggling back up the slanting tunnel, tense with the expectation that the wolves would charge. But by the time I reached the entrance, I had still not heard nor seen the slightest sign of movement from the wolves. I sat down on a stone and shakily lit a cigarette, becoming aware as I did so that I was no longer frightened. Instead, an irrational rage possessed me. If I had had my rifle, I believe I might have reacted in brute fury and tried to kill both wolves. The cigarette burned down and a wind began to blow. I began to shiver again, this time from cold instead of rage. My anger was passing and I was limp. Mine had been the fury of resentment born of fear, resentment against the beasts who had engendered naked terror in me and who, by so doing, had intolerably affronted my human ego. I was appalled at the realization of how easily I had forgotten all that the summer sojourn with the wolves had taught me about them and about myself. I thought of Angeline and her pup cowering at the bottom of the den where they had taken refuge from the thundering apparition of the aircraft, and I aimed. Somewhere to the eastward, a wolf howled, lightly, questioningly. I knew the voice, for I had heard it many times before. It was George, sounding the wasteland for an echo from the missing members of his family. But for me, it was a voice which spoke of the lost world which once was ours before we chose the alien role, a world which I had glimpsed and almost entered only to be excluded at the end by my own self. Chapter 3, Gender and Relationships Page 61, How Women Became the New Breadwinners A Review of the Book, The Richer Sex While women have taken the lead in college graduation rates and are near to reaching income equality at work, men seem to be lagging, held back by societal and familial preconceptions about what a man should be able to provide in an economy that no longer allows most families to get by on one income. With couples dating and marrying up and down the social ladder, new questions arise. How should a blue-collar husband and father react when his college-educated wife begins making twice his salary? Will ambitious women begin to want more of their mates than the men expect of themselves? In How Women Became the New Breadwinners, Liza Mundy draws on the latest research and the experiences of men and women across America to examine what happens when women become the breadwinners. Grades, the only curves that matter. While marrying up used to be thought the best means of social advancement for women, we now know that if there's one silver bullet for gender inequality, it's education. We're only just beginning to see what higher college graduation rates for women may mean. And it's not just that more women are graduating, but that in the United States, and more surprisingly in countries like Saudi Arabia and Mongolia, female university students now outnumber male students. Part of the reason women have overtaken men, Mundy writes, is because boys and their families are still working on the outdated principle that a young man can enter the trades and make a decent, reliable income. But that's often not the case anymore. Bye-bye, boys' clubs. One of the most fascinating phenomena driving gender changes in the workforce, Mundy says, is that of male flight, the tendency that men have to lose interest in or abandon a profession as more women enter it. Researchers have said that men show an aversion to what's been termed gender pollution. 
As women begin entering a field, the most cited example being veterinary medicine, young men begin to show less interest in that area of expertise. Older, established male veterinarians don't leave the field. It's just that the rising classes of veterinarians turn overwhelmingly female. Some researchers have predicted that this example can be used to predict what we'll see even in traditionally male professions like law. The women pour in, Mundy observes, and the men drain out. Equality of Ambition As women learn more, earn more, and expect more, they will look for mates with the same qualifications, Mundy says, and they will put up less with couch potato males whose greatest achievements involve video game hegemony. To be attracted to a man, women felt he needed to be moving forward, she observes. In interviews with women including a law student from Washington, D.C., and a 20-something who works in finance, Mundy found that women are careful when they survey the playing field of possible dates and often weigh a college education and other signs of drive equally with looks. It's about always trying to be a better version of yourself, one woman said. I find that somebody's lack of desire, their content to stay where they are and not move forward, it's not attractive. So, how much do you make? It's the question some women will learn to dread, Mundy predicts, and they will learn different ways to cope with it or avoid it. Income is one of the most common measures people use to compare themselves to one another. And while we all know that any number of intangibles contribute as much, if not more, to a sense of success, the tendency persists. Behind the question of how much one makes, women know that there remains a whole set of unasked questions about who trumps who in a relationship, and many of them will try to avoid the question entirely, especially in the dating world. Chivalry is never entirely deceased, no matter how pale around the edges it may look, and women know that men still want to be the ones to pick up the check. A new kind of trophy wife. Some researchers have said that men won't mind the idea of marrying up, and that in fact some data shows they've been more willing to do it all along. Men may realize that marrying a woman who's happy to shoulder their load may free them up as husbands and fathers in unexpected ways, and some men may actually begin to compete for women who want to have it all. A study in 2001 found that male respondents were much more likely to place a value on a woman's earnings than they were in previous generations, demonstrating that in some ways the qualities men and women look for in one another may have begun to equalize. In a shift, studies have also shown that there has been a wealth-beauty trade-off. Mundy found that men are becoming more interested in wealth and women in beauty. Page 69. Has Facebook destroyed the word friend? It is time for us to take back the word friend from Facebook. Lonely genius Mark Zuckerberg didn't have any friends, so he needed to create a system, a network, to obtain false friendships. He smartly baked the word friend into the DNA of Facebook, where it has become a generic label, a verb. In the process of Facebook becoming a juggernaut, the word friend has become ubiquitous and trashed and lost its true meaning. Friend me, like me. And Zuckerberg tapped into our natural obsessive qualities and insecurities, our need to be liked and to have more friends. Before Facebook, one would describe a friendship as a deep and long-term acquaintance, a person you know well and regard with affection and trust. He was my best friend at college. Facebook has lowered that barrier, and we are ushering in false friends too quickly into our lives, too close, too comfortable, too soon. 
So what can you do about this steady decline that is eroding true friendships? Delete people. I did so this past week. I removed 100 of my Facebook friends. Right now, I hover around 25 friends. And these are the people that really matter to me. It was rather easy, and I feel very relieved. When I post a Facebook status or share a photo, I am more natural with my inner circle of true friends and family. With a larger group of false friends, you can become too obsessed with how you are perceived. How will I be judged? What will they think of me? You create a public persona and try to be cool in a self-conscious and demonstrative style. And that's very uncool. Honestly, I don't care what an ex-girlfriend from 20 years ago thinks of me or some soccer mom that I had just met. The only opinions that matter are the opinions of your family and true friends. Before the launch of the popular social network, a friendship was described as a friend demonstrating the following on a consistent basis via Wikipedia. The tendency to desire what is best for the other. Sympathy and empathy. Honesty, perhaps in situations where it may be difficult for others to speak the truth, especially in terms of pointing out the perceived faults of one's counterpart. Mutual understanding and compassion. Trust in one another. Able to express feelings, including in relation to the other's actions without the fear of being judged, able to go to each other for emotional support. Positive reciprocity. A relationship is based on equal give and take between the two parties. Now, look at your Facebook friends. If they don't fall into the above, consider removing them. And don't be self-conscious. Don't worry about what they think or how they will perceive you. Never once worry, oh, what will they think if I defriend them? But you wouldn't be defriending a true friend anyway, correct? It is in your right to communicate in the style you are most comfortable with. Don't make excuses or blame it on your spouse. If it matters, just say you've gone family and close friends only. If someone that you've just met wants to friend you, just politely decline with a similar and brief statement. I believe in the social networking separation of church and state. For myself, I have family and close friends on Facebook and general acquaintances and professional contacts on LinkedIn. One could also consider creating two Facebook accounts, personal and professional pages. When a professional contact tries to friend me, I just tell them I use Facebook for sharing photos of my kids with my extended family, but please connect with me on LinkedIn, and I include a link to my profile. Facebook has eroded the true meaning of friendship, but it's not too late for us all to wise up. Before Facebook, it was an honor to call someone a friend. It had to be gained long-term with an emotion reward. Facebook fast-tracks that process, falsely, without the natural checks and balances. People get too casual, too chatty, too quickly. Really, who doesn't want to be liked and have friends? Friendless Zuckerberg has tapped into our natural insecurities, and there's a reason why Facebook is so successful. Meanwhile, go have lunch with a real friend in the real world and tell them how much you truly like them. Chapter 4. Beauty and Aesthetics. Page 83. Taj Mahal, India. Love moves mountains, according to the proverb, but rarely does it provide work for the architect. Faith and vanity throughout the centuries have often been the qualities that have inspired men to build. 
The majestic Taj Mahal, however, is a notable exception. The famous domed building is a memorial to the fervent love of Shah Jahan, the fifth ruler of the Mughal Empire, for a cherished wife who died in childbirth. According to legend, the queen's last wish was that the Shah build a monument so beautiful that whoever saw it could not help but sense the perfection of their love. Indeed, since its construction in the mid-17th century, the shimmering monument of white marble, set among tranquil gardens and pools, has attracted many tourists and pilgrims. Visitors are as moved by the many legends surrounding its creation as they are spellbound by its serene elegance. Strangely enough, the architect of the Taj Mahal is unknown, although claimants to the title are legion. The Indian version of the history of the Taj Mahal credits Ustad Isa, an itinerant from Turkey or Persia, as being the designer. One legend tells that Ustad Isa himself was an inconsolable widower in search of an opportunity to erect a worthy monument to his own wife. Other accounts claim variously that he was from the cities of Isfahan or Samarkand or from Russia and that he was either a Christian, a Jew, or an Arab. It is probable that the Taj Mahal was not the work of a single master at all, but the concerted efforts of many artists and craftsmen from all over Asia. Begun in 1631, the mausoleum took some 20,000 workmen 22 years to build at a cost of 40 million rupees. In one detail, however, the legends concur. Shah Jahan was apparently so pleased with the elegant mausoleum that he beheaded his chief architect, cut off the hands of the architect's assistants, and blinded the draftsmen so that they would never be able to create a building to rival it. It is a balanced and symmetric grouping of buildings, a harmonious synthesis of the architecture of Persia, India, and Central Asia, it combines, for example, the traditional design of Mughal gardens with the characteristically Indian use of minarets or towers and a dominant dome. The placement of a dome over an arched alcove is a characteristic of Persian architecture, successfully adapted in the Taj Mahal to a Mughal design. At the heart of the complex stands the mausoleum itself a massive eight-sided structure inset with arched iwans or half-domes of a classically mogul design. It is crowned by an immense bulbous dome, which is surrounded and set off by four minarets that rise to a height of 138 feet. Flanking the domed structure are a mosque and a second matching building known as the jawab or reply. Its sole function is to maintain the symmetry of the entire composition. An idyllic square garden, divided by oblong pools, is at the front of the mausoleum. These pools, in turn, are divided into fourths by avenues, four being the number sacred to Islam. This planned and calculated reordering of nature and the severe regularity of the lines of trees are characteristic of Persian gardens and are intended to invite spiritual contemplation. Unlike the French and English gardens, the Persian garden is not a setting for recreation and pleasure, but rather a retreat or sacred refuge from the disorder of temporal life. Under the great dome, within an octagonal hall, are the sarcophagi of the two lovers, enclosed by a screen of carved marble. In the exact center is the memorial tomb of Mumtaz Mahal. Next to it, but a little larger and higher, is that of Shah Jahan, the only asymmetrical element in the whole complex. However, both tombs are empty. The actual graves of the royal couple are in a small crypt beneath the burial hall. The Shah's tomb was not part of the original plan. Shah Jahan had planned to build another vast mausoleum for himself across the river from that of his loved one. However, when he died, his son, refusing to incur the expense of another tomb, betrayed his father's last wishes and buried him beside his beloved consort. Perhaps the single most alluring aspect of the Taj Mahal is the pervasive use of white marble. At different times of the day, the marble surfaces take on varying and delicate casts of color. Some travelers claim that the only way to fully appreciate the Taj Mahal is by moonlight, when its surface takes on an almost incandescent glow. One of the more descriptive and distinctly Victorian accounts of the singular effects of light at the Taj Mahal was written by Prince William of Sweden in one of his travel books after he visited the site in 1832. The sun shone so intensely on the dead white marble that one was forced to look with half-closed eyes or to wear smoked glasses to avoid being dazzled. The many delicate details now appeared to great advantage, and the inlaid work, especially with its wealth of stones of different colors, seemed to be masterly. Otherwise, I preferred the lovely moonlight effect of the evening before with its atmosphere of profound feeling, and it is thus that I would choose to remember this costliest gem among all the treasures of India.
Page 93. Korea's makeover from dull to hip changes the face of Asia. Kate Sui is from Hong Kong, but she's a fan of Korean television shows, and she keeps up with gossip about Korean celebrities on the internet. Her favorite is a beautiful soap opera star, Song Hai Kyo, whose bee stung lips and feminine features she admires. Korean actresses have prominent and elegant noses, says Miss Sui, a 25 year old aspiring actress. They look so pretty. So when Ms. Sui decided she'd have a better shot at breaking into the entertainment business after improving her looks with a surgical makeover, she knew where she wanted to go. In April, she flew more than 1,000 miles to a clinic in Seoul for operations to raise the bridge of her nose, make her eyes appear larger, and sharpen her chin. Across Asia, Korea is cool. From fashion to music to film, the country of 48 million people is redefining style. And as notions of Korean beauty become popularized by the country's exploding cultural exports, women from around the region, and some men too, are flocking to Seoul to have their faces remodeled. A lot of my patients bring a picture of a Korean star from a magazine and say, I want to look like that, says Chung Jong Pil, a surgeon who runs the Cinderella Plastic Surgery Clinic in a fashionable Seoul neighborhood. Dr. Chung estimates that just under 10% of his customers come from overseas. The rest are locals. Most of the foreign visitors come from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, he says. Zhang Dong Hak, a surgeon who specializes in rhinoplasty or nose jobs at another Seoul clinic, says roughly 15% of his patients are foreign. That number has been rising in the past few years. The increase has been very big since the Korean wave started, he says. The trend says a lot about Korea's own image makeover. Not long ago, many people saw the country as a decidedly uncool industrial park pumping out cheap cars and appliances. But that started to change in the late 1990s when the Korean government decided that entertainment could be an export industry. The film business in particular benefited from government help and a big influx of private capital. Now, countries from Japan to Singapore are flooded with Korean hip hop and pop acts, melodramatic soap operas, and movies from horror flicks to romantic comedies. The final episode of Jewel in the Palace, a dramatic series about court intrigue during Korea's Chosun Dynasty, starring Korean beauty Lee Young Ai in 2005, became the most watched television show in Hong Kong history. More than 40% of the city tuned in. Korean pop star Bo A outsells Britney Spears in Japan. In 2004, Chinese television stations carried more than 100 Korean shows. The popularity of Korean stars is establishing Korean ethnic features as a standard of beauty across the region. Some sociologists see a subtext in the craze a rebellion by Asian people against the images of Caucasian good looks that dominate much of the international media. Others see dangers. Wang Semei, Vice General Affairs Director of the All China Women's Federation, says the focus on beauty could result in long-term psychological damage for women who are banking too much on their looks. Korean culture is something worth studying, Ms. Wang says but we might have paid too much attention to their soap operas and pretty actresses. Critics also point out that what appeals to many about Korean looks are exactly features that make them look more Western. Koreans, related to the Mongols who once ruled the Central Asian steppes, the large flat lands of the region that is now called Mongolia, tend to have more prominent noses and often lighter skin than other Asians, the country's plastic surgeons say. In physical terms, the Korean ideal is a relatively small, oval face with a high-bridged nose and large eyes with Western-style eyelids. Caucasians and many other ethnic groups have eyelids with a fold that allows them to retract. Many Northeast Asians lack the fold, making their eyes appear smaller. Complicating the issue further, some Korean actresses have spoken openly about their own plastic surgeries. This has led to widespread speculation in Asia that nearly all Korean stars have gone under the knife. Purported before and after photos of Korean celebrities are widely available on the internet.
Just how common these procedures have become is hard to track, but the number of surgeons performing image-enhancing work such as nose jobs and eye lifts has increased sharply. The Korean Society of Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery, a professional group, says its membership has risen 85% to 960 since 2000. All the buzz and atmosphere makes young people today think surgery is common, says Lee Yasui, who runs the Taipei Office of International Plastic Surgery, which matches up foreign patients with Korean surgeons. Ms. Lee says business is growing amazingly. The company arranges for 15 to 20 foreigners to visit Korea for operations every month, with clients coming from Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong. The 27-year-old Ms. Lee had a nose job in Seoul herself earlier this year as part of a makeover ahead of her wedding. Korean surgeons are coy about their celebrity patients. In Dr. Chung's consulting room at the Cinderella Clinic, under the glass top on the coffee table are dozens of autographed Polaroid pictures of stylish pop musicians, actors, and actresses posing with Dr. Chung. The doctor describes the stars as friends, and won't disclose which of them are also patients. But Dr. Chung says that beliefs about the power of surgery to transform appearances can be a mixed blessing. People come with before and after pictures of celebrities, Dr. Chung says. People expect a lot because of those kinds of pictures, but it's not realistic. We'll tell people they will look better, but not like the stars in the pictures. Chapter five. Transitions, page 112. Conversations in Malaysia. Shafi worked for the Muslim cause. He didn't wear Arab clothes, but he understood the young men who did. Shafi had come to Kuala Lumpur from a village in the north. The disturbance of the move was still with him. Shafi said, When I was in the village, the atmosphere is entirely different. You come out of the village. You see all the bright lights, you begin to sense the materialistic civilization around you, and I forgot about my religion and my commitments, in the sense that you had to pray, but not to the extent of going out and doing nasty things like taking girls and drinking and gambling and drugs. I didn't lose my faith. I simply forgot to pray, forgot responsibilities, just losing myself. I got nothing firm in my framework. I just floating around, and didn't know my direction. I said, where did you live when you came to Kuala Lumpur? He didn't give a straight answer. At this early stage in our conversation, concreteness didn't come easily to him. He said, I was living in a suburb where I am exposed to materialistic civilization to which I had never been exposed before. Boys and girls can go out together. You are free from family control. You are free from society, who normally criticize you in a village when you do something bad. You take a goat, a cow, a buffalo, somewhere where the goat is being tied up all the time, and you release that goat and a bunch of other animals. The goat would just roam anywhere he want to go without any strings. Is that bad for the goat? I think the goat would be very happy to roam free. But for me, I don't think that would be good. If goat had brains, I would want to say, why do you want to roam about when you are tied and being fed by your master and looked after? Why do you want to roam about? I said, but I want to roam about. What do you mean by being free? Freedom for me is not something that you can roam anywhere you want. Freedom must be within the definition of a certain framework, because I don't think we are able to run around and get everything. That freedom means nothing. You must really frame yourself where you want to go and what you want to do. But didn't you know what you wanted to do when you came to Kuala Lumpur? The primary aim was education. That was a framework. But the conflict of this freedom and the primary aim is there, and I consider this is the problem I faced and many of my friends face. Other people in other countries face the same problem, Shafi said. Do they face the same restrictions of family life as I do? What restrictions? Religious restrictions. You have that frame with you. Religious tradition, family life, the society, the village community. Then you come into the city where people are running. People are free. The values contradict. You see, in the village where I was brought up, we have the bare minimum. We have rice to eat, house to live. We didn't go begging. 
In the city, you can buy a lunch at $10, or in a stall, you can have lunch for 50 cents. That excess of $9.50, which the city dwellers spent, will be spent by us on other purposes. To us, with our framework and tradition and religion, that is excessiveness. Sometimes, my wife feels that we should go back to the village, and I also feel the same. Not running away from the modern world, but trying to live a simpler, more meaningful life than coming to the city, where you have lots of waste and lots of things that is not real, probably. You are not honest to yourself if you can spend 50 cents and keep yourself from hunger, but instead spend $10. I will tell you about what. Recently, the government built a skating rink. After three months, they demolished it, because a highway going to be built over it. They are building big roads and highways across the villages. And whose lorries are passing by to collect the produce of the poor and to dump the products that is manufactured by the rich at an exorbitant price. Color TVs, refrigerators, air conditioners, transistor radios. Don't people want those things? In the end, they are going to use the color TVs, which the people enjoy, to advertise products to draw people into wasteful living. Village life, wouldn't you say it's dull for most people? The village? It's simple. It's devoid of, what shall I say, wastefulness. You shouldn't waste. You don't have to rush for things. My point about going back to the kampong, village, is to stay with the community and not to run away from development. The society is well knit. If someone passed away, there is an alarm in the kampong, where most of us would know who passed away and when he's going to be buried. What is the cause of death and what happened to the next of kin? Are they around? It is not polluted in the village. Physical pollution. Mental. Social. Social pollution? Something that contradicts our customs and traditions. A man cannot walk with a woman who doesn't belong to his family in the kampong. It is forbidden. Why is it wrong? The very essence of human respect and dignity comes from an honorable relationship of man and woman. You must have a law to protect the unit of your society. You need your family to be protected. When the girls come from the villages to Kuala Lumpur, they don't want to be protected by the law. Page 121 Grisha has arrived. Whenever Grisha was expected in the apartment on Novosibirskaya Street, Babushka made some piroshki filled with meat and cabbage. She would put on her blue checkered apron and seem instantly rejuvenated. Little Ina would seal these piroshki on a wooden board while Babushka presided over the boiling oil. Their shabby, sooty kitchen suddenly became bright and cheerful. In this way, Grisha's arrival became forever linked to an expectation of joyful festivity. He would rush in, thin and pale. At once, the long hallway, dimly lit by a single electric bulb, was filled with lively bustle. They played in the kitchen. It was warmer there. Babushka covered the large stove with an oilcloth. The stove would become the airport in the marshy forest. Grisha made paper airplanes and launched them skillfully from the stove towards the electric light. The small white airplanes briefly shone against the soot-covered ceiling and fell into the dark space near the door. Grisha would bring his tin soldiers. He was a guerrilla leader and little Ina was a doctor. They always played the same war game. Ina's military hospital was located in Babushka's room. Could Ina ever forget this narrow room with the fireplace and the photograph of a young woman on the dressing table? There, among various treasures with which Ina was not allowed to play, was a carved box with letters. Later, she would read these yellowed sheets, which Babushka had preserved so carefully. They were letters from her mother, who had died in a labor camp. Ina could not remember her parents. She had been raised by Babushka, while Grisha had been adopted by relatives of their father. Memory is a strange thing. In its vast, foggy valleys, one's past is kept untouched. Now, when 42-year-old Ina was on the way to the airport to meet her brother coming from Moscow, the smell of the swamp grass suddenly released distant memories of frying piroshki, of childhood, of bliss. On the stairs of the airport, Ina came face to face with Grisha, but did not recognize him at first. His hair had gone completely gray, and he seemed shorter. She was struck at once by how badly he was dressed. He was wearing a brown raincoat fit only for picking mushrooms. 
His worn out shoes were of an indefinable color. Grisha was carrying a small suitcase. They embraced, kissed, and walked slowly to her car. Grisha was telling her excitedly about the flight across the ocean, about the last days before departure, how frightened he had been that he might fall ill and be unable to come. Ina was listening to Grisha happily and distractedly. She realized that he must be tired from lack of sleep, but why this pathetic shabbiness? Why would Yelena have allowed him to leave home in this godforsaken state? They had a marvelous apartment and dacha country house. Both were working, and Grisha earned substantial amounts from translations. As though he had read her mind, Grisha said, do you know, all our acquaintances advised me to travel in my oldest clothes so that I could discard them without regret here. They said that you, my sister, anyway, would clothe me and Yelena and our children. Maybe it was because she had no family of her own that Ina was very attached to Grisha's children. She gave them expensive presents and spoiled them, especially his oldest daughter, Luba. Ina tolerated Yelena no more than that. Her relationship with her brother's wife had gone wrong from the very beginning. Probably deep down, Ina envied Yelena. They soon reached home. Ina put a bowl with fruit on the table and a bottle of French wine, which she had bought yesterday to welcome Grisha. Grisha opened his suitcase and brought out presents from himself and Yelena, from Luba and Yura, who had already had families of their own, and from Ina's numerous friends and relatives. There was an amber brooch, perfumes, books, wooden spoons, and a small exquisite box from Boris. He had put a sheet of paper with comical verses for Ina's birthday into the box. How many years had passed since she had seen his familiar, bold handwriting? Ina had been a young girl in Moscow when she had become involved with Boris, who was much older. On various occasions, he had left his wife to move in with Ina. At other times, he had left her to return to his family. Ina had been his friend, his mistress, his graduate student, and eventually his co-worker in the laboratory. This pattern of life had continued up to the time of her leaving Moscow. Brother and sister sat on the balcony, smoking and talking almost till dawn. From the 12th floor, there was a view over Edmonton and the dark river valley, spanned by a bridge. Below them, the streetlights shone moistly. Grisha walked about the apartment, inspecting Ina's habitation. For a while, he remained in the bedroom, where beside the bed, there was a large desk with a computer. On the chest of drawers, he found their mother's faded photograph in its walnut frame that had stood in Babushka's room. In the kitchen, he wanted to know how the dishwasher worked and opened the door to the microwave oven. Ina made a bed for Grisha on the living room sofa. The following morning, she got up as early as usual. She was tired from lack of sleep and took two Tylenol tablets before going into the kitchen to prepare breakfast. Grisha was up already and was doing yoga exercises on the balcony. After breakfast, they went for a walk and then to the university. Ina showed Grisha her laboratory. As it was a holiday, the university campus was deserted. They ate in a small Chinese restaurant. The evening was spent sitting on the balcony. Ina brought out albums with photographs taken on various trips, one to France and Spain, another to the Scandinavian countries, still another to South America, and finally one to Indonesia and Hong Kong. Grisha was inebriated by these bright photographs and looked at his sister with admiration. They were drinking tea with cake when Grisha suddenly asked, how much does a lada cost here? I don't know, perhaps around 5,000 or maybe seven. Why do you want to know? Ina was very surprised. You see, it can be paid for here, and Euro would be able to get it in Moscow. Many people buy them in this way for their relatives. Really? They buy a whole car? Of course, they can't buy it in pieces, can they? Grisha started laughing. The magnitude of his expectations and naive faith in her financial prowess struck Ina like a splash of cold water. All her achievements, of which she had been so proud only yesterday, were reduced to rubble and lost their significance. The woman in the rocking chair was suddenly middle-aged and lonely. For myself, I bought a second-hand car, and that was almost seven years ago. Ina cut herself short. In the depth of Grisha's eyes, as in two dark mirrors, she saw herself as she must have appeared to him, a rich world traveler. Every morning, Grisha got up early and did yoga exercises frantically. Then he went to the swimming pool. The high-rise building in which Ina lived had a sauna and whirlpool in the basement. 
Grisha took childish pleasure in everything and was very enthusiastic. He was indefatigable. Ina took a vacation in order to devote herself completely to her brother. She showed him the sports complex, which belonged to the university. They pushed a shopping cart around the superstore, which was the size of an airplane hangar. They bought groceries, and Grisha had his picture taken against a backdrop of mountains of fruits and vegetables and colorful cans of cat food. They spent a whole day at West Edmonton Mall, the world-famous shopping center. They wandered through the shops, inspected Fantasyland, and while there, took a trip in a submarine. They had lunch in a French cafe. The mountain of goods on the living room floor grew and threatened to become Mount Everest, but the shopping list hardly got shorter. A sheepskin coat for Luba, high winter boots for Yura's wife, a waterproof coat for Yelena, a videotape recorder, some kind of rings for the camera of the sister of Luba's husband, a Japanese Walkman radio for Yura, and a mouthpiece for a trumpet belonging to some person unknown to her. It was a Herculean task. Grisha had excellent taste and an unfailing sense for what was beautiful and very expensive. He said to Ina, we must buy this blouse for Luba. The blouse was certainly unusually pretty. Ina would have bought it for herself if it had been on sale. Goodness how she had waited for him, her only brother. She would have liked to complain to him of her loneliness, the fact that her job was only a temporary five-year contract and that her future looked extremely uncertain. After all was said and done, the trips that she had taken to conferences and seminars were all that she possessed. His visit lasted over two weeks, and not counting the first evening, when they had sat on the balcony and smoked, there had not been a free moment when they could have had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. She wondered if such a talk was even possible. She had expected a very significant moment in her life, the family reunion, and it had turned out to be very prosaic, even mundane. The gap between brother and sister was widening at an alarming rate. His trip gradually became transformed into a giant shopping expedition to North America. Each day spent wandering through stores moved them further apart into mutual incomprehension. Once, Ina took Grisha to dinner with Lyova, who, amazing coincidence, had been Grisha's fellow pupil in the eighth grade of Moscow School No. 214. Ina's and Grisha's arrival was eagerly awaited in the elegant two-story house overlooking the ravine. Other guests were drinking cocktails on the wooden veranda surrounded by creepers. Later on, there was a barbecue on the lawn. Grisha was enthusiastic about the barbecued meat, which he had never tasted before. For dessert, Leova's wife brought out a basket carved out of a pineapple filled with large, fresh strawberries. Grisha soaked up all this like a sponge. He committed it to memory, imagining how he would relate every minute detail in Moscow. To Grisha, Ina's new life must seem just a fragrant pineapple strawberry basket, which only lacked immortality to be perfect. Suddenly, Ina felt exhausted. She felt that she was participating in some sort of farce, that she was on stage and Grisha was viewing her from the back of a hall without being able to hear her. The loneliness became unbearable. People were laughing on the veranda. In the house, Leova demonstrated his new stereo system with the compact disc player to Grisha. Through the open window, Ina could see Grisha's forced smile and the sweat droplets on his forehead. She felt sorry for him and wanted more than anything for him to leave as soon as possible. She went down from the veranda and walked along the path to the ravine. The air smelt fresh and moist. From that angle, her friend's brightly lit house seemed even grander. I wonder how Boris would have behaved, she thought. Was it possible that he, too? Experience determines consciousness. Ina remembered the long-forgotten Marxist formula. During the last days before leaving, Grisha could talk only of the customs inspection in Moscow. He flew off on July 15th. Next time, I will bring Yelena, Grisha promised when leaving. From the airport, Ina drove straight to work. She was sad and felt like crying. The small white airplane of her childhood vanished in the empty blue sky. Chapter 6, The Mind, page 138. A Memory for All Seasonings. One evening two years ago, Peter Polson, a member of the psychology department at the University of Colorado, took his son and daughter to dinner at Bananas, a fashionable restaurant in Boulder. 
When the waiter took their orders, Polson noticed that the young man didn't write anything down. He just listened, made small talk, told them that his name was John Conrad, and left. Polson didn't think this was exceptional. There were, after all, only three of them at the table. Yet he found himself watching Conrad closely when he returned to take the orders at a nearby table of eight. Again, the waiter listened, chatted, and wrote nothing down. When he brought Polson and his children their dinners, the professor couldn't resist introducing himself and telling Conrad that he'd been observing him. The young man was pleased. He wanted customers to notice that unlike other waiters, he didn't use a pen and paper. Sometimes when they did notice, they left him quite a large tip. He had once handled a table of 19 complete dinner orders without a single error. At Bananas, a party of 19, a bill of roughly $200, would normally leave the waiter a $35 tip. They had left Conrad $85. Polson was impressed enough to ask the waiter whether he would like to come to the university's psychology lab and let them run some tests on him. Anders Ericsson, a young Swedish psychologist recently involved in memory research, would be joining the university faculty soon, and Polson thought that he would be interested in exploring memory methods with the waiter. Conrad said he would be glad to cooperate. He was always on the lookout for ways to increase his income, and Polson told him he would receive $5 an hour to be a guinea pig. Conrad, of course, was not the first person with an extraordinary memory to attract attention from researchers. Alexander R. Luria, the distinguished Soviet psychologist studied a Russian newspaper reporter named Cherishevsky for many years and wrote about him in The Mind of a Mnemonist, Basic Books, 1968. Luria says that Cherishevsky was able to hear a series of 50 words spoken once and recite them back in perfect order 15 years later. Another famous example of extraordinary memory, the conductor Arturo Toscanini was known to have memorized every note for every instrument in 250 symphonies and 100 operas. For decades, the common belief among psychologists was that memory was a fixed quantity. An exceptional memory, or a poor one, was something with which a person was born. This point of view has come under attack in recent years. Expert memory is no longer universally considered the exclusive gift of the genius or the abnormal. People with astonishing memory for pictures, musical scores, chess positions, business transactions, dramatic scripts, or faces are by no means unique, wrote Cornell psychologist Ulrich Nesser in Memory Observed, 1981. They may not even be very rare. Some university researchers, including Polson and Erickson, go a step further than Nesser. They believe that there are no physiological differences at all between the memory of a Cherishevsky or a Toscanini and that of the average person. The only real difference, they believe, is that Toscanini trained his memory, exercised it regularly, and wanted to improve it. Like many people with his capacity to remember, Toscanini may also have used memory tricks called mnemonics. Cherishevsky, for example, employed a technique known as loci, as soon as he heard a series of words, he mentally distributed them along Gorky Street in Moscow. If one of the words was orange, he might visualize a man stepping on an orange at a precise location on the familiar street. Later, in order to retrieve orange, he would take an imaginary walk down Gorky Street and see the image from which it could easily be recalled. Did the waiter at Bananas have such a system? What was his secret? John Conrad would be the subject of Anders Ericsson's second in-depth study of the machinations of memory. As a research associate at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Ericsson had spent the previous three years working with William Chase on an extensive study of Steve Falloon, an undergraduate whose memory and intellectual skills were considered average. When Ericsson and Chase began testing Falloon, he could remember no more than seven random digits after hearing them spoken once. According to generally accepted research, almost everyone is capable of storing five to nine random digits in short-term memory. After 20 months of working with Chase and Erickson, Falloon could memorize and retrieve 80 digits. The important thing about our testing Falloon is that researchers usually study experts, Chase says. We studied a novice and watched him grow into an expert. Initially, we were just running tests to see whether his digit span could be expanded. For four days, he could not go beyond seven digits. On the fifth day, 
he discovered his mnemonic system and then began to improve rapidly. Falloon's intellectual abilities didn't change, the researchers say, nor did the storage capacity of his short-term memory. Chase and Erickson believe that short-term memory is a more or less fixed quantity. It reaches saturation quickly, and to overcome its limitations, one must learn to link new data with material that is permanently stored in long-term memory. Once the associations have been made, the short-term memory is free to absorb new information. Cherashevsky transferred material from short-term to long-term memory by placing words along Gorky Street in Moscow. Falloon's hobby was long-distance running, and he discovered that he could break down a spoken list of 80 digits into units of three or four and associate most of these with running times. To Falloon, a series like 4012 would translate as four minutes, one and two-tenth seconds, or near a four-minute mile. 2147 would be encoded as two hours, 14 minutes, seven seconds, or an excellent marathon time. When running didn't provide the link to his long-term memory, ages and dates did. 1944 is not relevant to running, but it is near the end of World War II. Chase and Erickson see individual differences in memory performance as resulting from previous experience and mental training. In sum, they write, Adult memory performance can be described by a single model of memory. Not every student of psychology agrees with Chase and Erickson, of course. I'm very suspicious of saying that everyone has the same kind of memory, says Matthew Urdelli, a psychologist at Brooklyn College. In my research, he says, I find that people have very different memory levels. They can all improve, but some levels remain high and some remain low. There are dramatic individual differences. It is unlikely that there will be any agreement among psychologists on the conclusions that they have thus far drawn from their research. The debate about exceptional memory will continue. But in the meantime, it is interesting to look deeper into the mind of a contemporary mnemonist. Erickson and Polson, both of whom have tested Conrad over the past two years, believe that there is nothing intellectually outstanding about him. When they began testing Conrad's memory, his digit scan was normal, about seven numbers. His grades in college were average. Conrad himself says that he is unexceptional mentally, but he has compared his earliest memories with others and has found that he can recall things that many people can't. His first distinct memory is lying on his back and raising his legs so that his mother could change his diapers. As a high school student, he didn't take notes in class. He says he preferred watching the girls take notes, and he has never made a list in his life. By never writing down a list of things to do and letting it think for me, he says, I've forced my memory to improve. Conrad does believe that his powers of observation, including his ability to listen, are keener than most people's. Memory, he says, is just one part of the whole process of observation. I'm not extraordinary, but sometimes people make me feel that way. I watch them and realize how many of them have disorganized minds and memories, and that makes me feel unusual. A good memory is nothing more than an organized one. One of the first things Conrad observed at Bananas was that the head waiter, his boss, was a very unpleasant woman. He disliked being her subordinate and he wanted her job. The only way he could get it was by being a superior waiter. He stayed up nights trying to figure out how to do this. The idea of memorizing orders eventually came to him. Within a year, he was the head waiter. One of the most interesting things we've found, says Erickson, is that just trying to memorize things does not ensure that your memory will improve. It's the active decision to get better and the number of hours you push yourself to improve that make the difference. Motivation is much more important than innate ability. Conrad began his memory training by trying to memorize the orders for a table of two, then progressed to memorizing larger orders. He starts by associating the entree with the customer's face. He might see a large, heavy-set man and hear, I'd like a big, bolder steak. Sometimes, Peter Polson says, John thinks a person looks like a turkey and that customer orders a turkey sandwich. Then it's easy. In memorizing how long meat should be cooked, the different salad dressings and starches, Conrad relies on patterns of repetition and variation. John breaks things up into chunks of four, Erickson says. If he hears rare, rare, medium, well done, he instantly sees a pattern in their relationship. Sometimes he makes a mental graph. An easy progression, rare, medium, rare, medium, well done, would take the shape of a steadily ascending line on his graph. 
a more difficult order, medium, well done, rare, medium, would resemble a mountain range. The simplest part of Conrad's system is his encoding of salad dressings. He uses letters, B for blue cheese, H for the house dressing, O for oil and vinegar, F for French, T for Thousand Island. A series of orders always arranged according to entree might spell a word like B-O-O-T or a near word like B-O-O-F or make a phonetic pattern, F-O-F-O. As Erickson says, Conrad remembers orders, regardless of their size, in chunks of four. This is similar to the way Falloon stores digits, and it seems to support Chase and Erickson's contention that short-term memory is limited and that people are most comfortable working with small units of information. One of the most intriguing things about Conrad is the number of ways he can associate material. Another is the speed with which he is able to call it up from memory. Erickson and Polson have also tested him with animals, units of time, flowers, and metals. At first, his recall was slow and uncertain, but with relatively little practice, he could retrieve these orders almost as quickly as he could food. The difference between someone like John, who has a trained memory, and the average person, says Erickson, is that he can encode material in his memory fast and effortlessly. It's similar to the way you can understand English when you hear it spoken. In our tests in the lab, he just gets better and faster. What John Conrad has, says Polson, is not unlike an athletic skill. With two or 300 hours of practice, you can develop these skills in the same way you can learn to play tennis. End of CD1. CD1, Mosaic 2 Reading, by Brenda Wegman and Mickey Knizovich. Copyright 2013, by the McGraw-Hill Companies, Incorporated. No part of this publication may be reproduced or distributed in any form or by any means or stored in a database or retrieval system without the prior written consent of the McGraw-Hill Companies, Incorporated including, but not limited to, any network or other electronic storage or transmission for broadcast or distance learning. Chapter 7, Working, page 169. The San Francisco sculptor who created Nicolas Cage's Dreadful Dragon in an old warehouse in an industrial section of town, San Francisco sculptor Manuel Palos takes the plebeian, common, fireplace and turns it into a monumental work of art. Plaster molds representing many periods and styles line the walls of his shop. Pinned on one wall is a sketch of a mantle for a restored Victorian house. I will give the owner two options, says Palos, who wears jeans and a black t-shirt covered with white plaster dust. A green beret partially hides his curly, gray-flecked hair. One will be traditional, the other softer and rounder in scale. Over the course of his 30-year career, Palos has designed many fireplaces for businesses and private residences. Two are in San Francisco hotels. The Galleria Park has an 8-foot by 8-foot Art Nouveau style with undulating curves, while the Villa Florence has a traditional European design. Another fireplace is in the First Interstate Bank, and he counts among his personal clients the Gallo family and Donald Trump. Worked on many San Francisco landmarks. Palos also has worked on many of the city's famous landmarks. He re-sculpted six life-sized mythological figures at the California Palace of the Legion of Honor in Lincoln Park and made eight 13-foot-tall eagles for Pacific Bell's San Francisco headquarters. He worked on the old City of Paris building when Neiman Marcus moved in and restored friezes and urns at the Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park. He is working on a bronze medallion to go outside San Francisco's Hall of Justice. But it is the dreadful dragon fireplace for actor Nicolas Cage's Pacific Heights home that is his most memorable piece. Every time I talk about it, I get excited, says Palos. It was challenging, but it was also a labor of love. 
Cage stopped by Paulus's studio one morning last year, wearing a baseball hat and ripped jeans. I didn't know who he was, Paulus says. He told me he wanted a fireplace made out of stone. I asked him if he had a design, and he said he wanted a dragon. I thought he was kidding, so I played along. I told him I could make a huge dragon from the floor to the ceiling, with the mouth as the opening. He looked at me and said, that's exactly what I want. Cage left a deposit, and that's when Palos got scared. I had to make the dragon I proposed. By the book. Using a children's book about dragons, Palos sketched a design. When it was approved, he made a clay model before casting the real thing in stone. For nearly five months, Palos labored over the sculpture. Cage wanted black limestone and the 13-foot-tall by 10-foot-wide piece required four and a half tons. Palos moved to a studio in Mexico because that was the only place he could find big enough. Every line had to match, says Palos of the bends and sinewy coils. He chiseled the dragon's nostrils to flare and created fiery-looking eyes. He used pneumatic tools to carve the hooked beak, scales, and fang-like teeth for maximum control. If any part of the face broke, I would have to start over. When finished, the sculpture was loaded on a truck and Palos drove it back to the United States himself. Heavy Duty Installation Cage's San Francisco house is a Victorian, and before the fireplace could be installed, the walls and the foundation had to be reinforced to hold the weight. It took a crane to lift the fireplace from the street to the house. Palos and four assistants rolled it up a ramp and in the front door. It had shipped in 13 pieces and was reassembled using a special scaffold and pulley system. Stainless steel pins and epoxy secured it, while Palos carved and shaped it to fit the entire living room wall. At the end of three weeks, everything was in place. The son of a shoemaker, Palos moved to San Francisco from Zacatecas, Mexico, while in his early 20s, to learn how to sculpt. He took a job making molds and models, studying English at night. My teachers encouraged me to travel, he says, so he spent several months visiting museums and galleries throughout Europe. I learned from the masters, but I developed my own style. Paulos opened his own studio in San Francisco many years ago. Eight people work for him, including his daughter Alexandra, who helps in the office. He prefers to sculpt on weekends when things are quiet and he can really produce. They think I am Sicilian. Every year, Palos makes a six-week pilgrimage back to Europe to the small town of Carrara, Italy, known for its marble, which Michelangelo used to sculpt the Pietà. They think I am Sicilian, says Palos, who is fluent in Italian. A showroom adjoins his studio where much of his artistic work, torsos, fountains, statues, and urns, is on display. Not everything is classical in style. A scale model of the dreadful dragon leans against one wall, and a woman's head carved out of sleek black Belgian marble is in the contemporary mode. When asked about his favorite, it is still the dreadful dragon, he says. Cage came to my studio and shook my hand when it was all over, Paulos recalls. He said, you are an artist. I told him, it takes two. Page 178 a lifetime of learning to manage effectively. Years ago, when I was a young assistant professor at Harvard Business School, I thought that the key to developing managerial leadership lay in raw brain power. I thought the role of business schools was to develop future managers who knew all about the various functions of business, to teach them how to define problems succinctly, analyze these problems, and identify alternatives in a clear, logical fashion and finally, to teach them to make an intelligent decision. My thinking gradually became tempered by living and working outside the United States and by serving seven years as a college president. During my presidency of Babson College, I added several additional traits or skills that I felt a good manager must possess. The first is the ability to express oneself in a clear, articulate fashion. Good oral and written communication skills are absolutely essential if one is to be an effective manager. Second, one must possess that intangible set of qualities called leadership skills. To be a good leader, one must understand and be sensitive to people and be able to inspire them toward the achievement of common goals. 
Next, I concluded that effective managers must be broad human beings who not only understand the world of business, but also have a sense of the cultural, social, political, historical, and particularly today, the international aspects of life and society. This suggests that exposure to the liberal arts and humanities should be part of every manager's education. Finally, as I pondered the business and government-related scandals that have occupied the front pages of newspapers, it became clear that a good manager in today's world must have courage and a strong sense of integrity. He or she must know where to draw the line between right and wrong. That can be agonizingly difficult. Drawing a line in a corporate setting sometimes involves having to make a choice between what appears to be conflicting rights. For example, if one is faced with a decision whether or not to close an ailing factory, whose interests should prevail? Those of stockholders? Of employees? Of customers? Or those of the community in which the factory is located? It's a tough choice, and the typical manager faces many others. Sometimes these choices involve simple questions of honesty or truthfulness. More often, they are more subtle and involve such issues as having to decide whether to cut corners and economize to meet profit objectives that may be beneficial in the short run, but that are not in the best long-term interests of the various groups being served by one's company. Making the right choice in situations such as these clearly demands integrity and the courage to follow where one's integrity leads. But now I have left behind the cap and gown of a college president and put on the hat of chief executive officer. As a result of my experience as a corporate CEO, my list of desirable managerial traits has become still longer. It now seems to me that what matters most in the majority of organizations is to have reasonably intelligent, hardworking managers who have a sense of pride and loyalty toward their organization, who can get to the root of a problem and are inclined toward action who are decent human beings with a natural empathy and concern for people, who possess humor, humility, and common sense, and who are able to couple drive with stick to and patience in the accomplishment of a goal. It is the ability to make positive things happen that most distinguishes the successful manager from the mediocre or unsuccessful one. It is far better to have dependable managers who can make the right things happen in a timely fashion than to have brilliant, sophisticated, highly educated executives who are excellent at planning and analyzing, but who are not so good at implementing. The most cherished manager one who says, I can do it, and then does. Many business schools continue to focus almost exclusively on the development of analytical skills. As a result, these schools are continuing to graduate large numbers of MBAs and business majors who know a great deal about analyzing strategies, dissecting balance sheets, and using computers, but who still don't know how to manage. As a practical matter, of course, schools can go only so far in teaching their students to manage. Only hard knocks and actual work experience will fully develop the kinds of managerial traits, skills, and virtues that I have discussed here. Put another way, the best way to learn to manage is to manage. Companies such as mine that hire aspiring young managers can help the process along by providing good role models and mentors, setting clear standards and high expectations that emphasize the kind of broad leadership traits that are important to the organization and then rewarding young managers accordingly, letting young managers actually manage. Having thereby encouraged those who are not only the best and the brightest, but also broad, sensitive human beings possessing all of the other traits and virtues essential for their managerial leadership to rise to the top, we just might be able to breathe a bit more easily about the future health of industry and society. Chapter 8. Breakthroughs. Page 201. Trees for Democracy. When I was growing up in Nyeri in central Kenya, there was no word for desert in my mother tongue, Kikuyu. Our land was fertile and forested. But today in Nyeri, as in much of Africa and the developing world, water sources have dried up. The soil is parched and unsuitable for growing food, and conflicts over land are common. So it should come as no surprise that I was inspired to plant trees to help meet the basic needs of rural women. As a member of the National Council of Women of Kenya in the early 1970s, I listened as women related what they wanted but did not have enough of. Energy, clean drinking water, and nutritious food. My response was to begin planting trees with them to help heal the land and break the cycle of poverty. 
Trees stop soil erosion, leading to water conservation and increased rainfall. Trees provide fuel, material for building and fencing, fruits, fodder, shade, and beauty. As household managers in rural and urban areas of the developing world, women are the first to encounter the effects of ecological stress. It forces them to walk farther to get wood for cooking and heating, to search for clean water, and to find new sources of food as old ones disappear. My idea evolved into the Green Belt Movement, made up of thousands of groups, primarily of women, who have planted 30 million trees across Kenya. The women are paid a small amount for each seedling they grow, giving them an income as well as improving their environment. The movement has spread to countries in East and Central Africa. Through this work, I came to see that environmental degradation by poor communities was both a source of their problems and a symptom. Growing crops on steep mountain slopes leads to loss of topsoil and land deterioration. Similarly, deforestation causes rivers to dry up and rainfall patterns to shift, which in turn result in much lower crop yields and less land for grazing. In the 1970s and 1980s, as I was encouraging farmers to plant trees on their land, I also discovered that corrupt government agents were responsible for much of the deforestation by illegally selling off land and trees to well-connected developers. In the early 1990s, the livelihoods, the rights, and even the lives of many Kenyans in the Rift Valley were lost when elements of President Daniel Arap Moi's government encouraged ethnic communities to attack one another over land. Supporters of the ruling party got the land, while those in the pro-democracy movement were displaced. This was one of the government's ways of retaining power. If communities were kept busy fighting over land, they would have less opportunity to demand democracy. Land issues in Kenya are complex and easily exploited by politicians. Communities needed to understand and be sensitized about the history of land ownership and distribution in Kenya and Africa. We held seminars on human rights, governing, and reducing conflict. In time, the Green Belt Movement became a leading advocate of reintroducing multi-party democracy and free and fair elections in Kenya. Through public education, political advocacy, and protests, we also sought to protect open spaces and forests from unscrupulous developers who were often working hand in hand with politicians. Mr. Moy's government strongly opposed ads for democracy and environmental rights, harassment, beatings, Death threats and jail time followed for me and for many others. Fortunately, in 2002, Kenyans realized their dream and elected a democratic government. What we've learned in Kenya, the symbiotic relationship between the sustainable management of natural resources and democratic governance is also relevant globally. Indeed, Many local and international wars, like those in West and Central Africa and the Middle East, continue to be fought over resources. In the process, human rights, democracy, and democratic space are denied. I believe the Nobel Committee recognized the links between the environment, democracy, and peace, and sought to bring them to worldwide attention with the peace prize that I am accepting today. The committee, I believe, is seeking to encourage community efforts to restore the earth at a time when we face the ecological crises of deforestation, desertification, water scarcity, and a lack of biological diversity. Unless we properly manage resources like forests, water, land, minerals, and oil, we will not win the fight against poverty, and there will not be peace. Old conflicts will rage on, and new resource wars will erupt unless we change the path we are on. To celebrate this award and the work it recognizes of those around the world, let me recall the words of Gandhi. My life is my message. Also, plant a tree. Page 208
A Revolution in Medicine. Anne Miscoy had seen her father and her uncle die of organ failure in their mid-forties. So she figured she was lucky to be living when she turned 50 last year. The trouble was she felt half dead. Her joints ached, her hair was falling out, and she was plagued by unrelenting fatigue. Her doctor assured her that nothing was seriously wrong, even after a blood test revealed unusually high iron levels. But Miscoy wasn't so sure. Scanning the internet, she learned about a hereditary condition called hemochromatosis, in which the body stores iron at dangerous concentrations in the blood, tissues, and organs. Hemochromatosis is the nation's most common genetic illness, and probably the most underdiagnosed. As Miscoy read about it, everything started making sense. Her symptoms, her blood readings, even her relatives' early deaths. So she found a doctor who would take her concerns more seriously. Until recently, diagnosing the condition required a liver biopsy, not a procedure to be taken lightly. But Muscoy didn't have to go that route. Scientists isolated the gene for hemochromatosis a few years ago and developed a test that can spot it in a drop of blood. Muscoy tested positive, and the diagnosis may well have saved her life. Through a regimen of weekly bloodlettings, she was able to reduce her iron level before her organs sustained lasting damage. She's now free of symptoms, and as long as she gives blood every few months, she should live a normal lifespan. Without the DNA test, I would have had a hard time convincing any doctor that I had a real problem. Hemochromatosis testing could save millions of lives in coming decades, and it's just one early hint of the changes that the sequencing of the human genome could bring. By 2010, says Dr. Francis Collins of the National Human Genome Research Institute, Screening tests will enable anyone to gauge his or her unique health risks down to the body's tolerance for cigarettes and cheeseburgers. Meanwhile, genetic discoveries will trigger a flood of new pharmaceuticals, drugs aimed at the causes of disease rather than the symptoms, and doctors will start prescribing different treatments for different patients, depending on their genetic profiles. The use of genes as medicine is probably farther off, but Collins believes even that will be routine within a few decades. By 2050, he said recently, many potential diseases will be cured at the molecular level before they arise. That may be a bit optimistic, but the trends Collins foresees are already well in motion. Clinical labs now perform some 4 million genetic tests each year in the United States. Newborns are routinely checked for sickle cell anemia, congenital thyroid disease, and phenylketonuria a metabolic disease that causes retardation. Like hemochromatosis, these conditions are catastrophic if they go undetected, but highly manageable when they're spotted early. Newer tests can help people from cancer-prone families determine whether they've inherited the culpable mutation. My mother died of colon cancer at age 47, says Dr. Bert Vogelstein, an oncologist at Johns Hopkins and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. If we had known she was genetically at risk, we could have screened for the disease and caught it early. Early detection is just the beginning. Genes help determine not only whether we get sick, but also how we respond to various treatments. In the past, says Dr. William Evans of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, the questions were, how old are you and how much do you weigh? Now, thanks to recent genetic discoveries, Physicians can sometimes determine who stands to benefit from a given drug and who might be harmed by it. Only a handful of clinics are using gene tests to guide drug therapy, but the practice, known as pharmacogenetics, is spreading fast. Researchers are now learning to predict reactions to treatments for asthma, diabetes, heart disease, and migraines. And firms like Insight Genomics are developing chips that can analyze thousands of genes at a time. My vision is that everyone will be sequenced at birth, says Dr. Mark Retain of the University of Chicago. Parents will get a CD-ROM with their child's genetic sequence. When physicians prescribe drugs, they'll use it to optimize treatment. Chapter 9, Art and Entertainment, page 229. What makes Van Gogh so great? Two years ago, on a visit to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, I walked into the room that contains Van Gogh's masterpiece, Starry Night. I noticed how many people entered the room, which also held tremendous and even iconic works by Matisse, Rousseau, and others, 
and stopped short when they saw the Van Gogh. Perhaps it's our familiarity with the tragic, often exaggerated, story behind his paintings of the unstable, starving artist toiling in obscurity. Or perhaps it's the deceptively unsophisticated brushwork and composition which testified to the dogged determination that allowed the artist to achieve greatness. He is a guy who did not have any natural-born talent, says Mark Mayer, director of the National Gallery of Canada, which opens a major exhibition of Van Gogh's work next Friday. He became a great artist through sheer effort and will. He was not born talented to make pictures. His early works are gruesome. This is something he wanted to do, he needed to do, and he did it. He did it and it was great, a status that can be bestowed on an artist only by the passage of time. Today, 122 years after the doomed Dutchman finished his last paintings, including a portrait of his doctor, Gachet, that sold in 1990 for $82.5 million U.S. and would certainly sell for at least twice that today, we are all but united in our opinion of his greatness. We also recognize his profound influence on everything after. He achieved something, a kind of euphony in those colors that remind us of nature, but is not nature, Mayer says. It's something else. It's something invented, but it's almost as beautiful as nature. It's just magic. To try to understand how Van Gogh did what he did, look at how he did it. Before he became an artist, he had drawn occasionally, and he greatly admired art. But until about 1880, he showed no interest in being an artist. Until then, he had failed at everything he'd done, despite his intense and obsessive personality, including a brief failed start as an art dealer, a misbegotten attempt to enter the clergy, a wandering evangelical mission, and a foray into magazine illustration— Write Stephen Nefay and Gregory White Smith in the most recent of countless biographies, Van Gogh, The Life. At 27, Van Gogh decided to begin what Nefay and Smith call his blazingly short career as a painter. The decision was, says Simon Shama in the documentary series The Power of Art, his road to Damascus moment. The religious metaphor is apt. Before the middle of the 20th century, Madras, Eckstein's The Canadian Historian, writes, admiration of the painter's work was so vast and deep that it was labeled the Van Gogh religion. More to the point, Van Gogh's mother, Anna, taught her son that the sun was the sweet Lord whose light gave life to plants just as God gave peace to our hearts and the stars were the sun's promise to return in the morning to make light out of darkness, write Nefay and Smith. All of these lessons in symbolism were eventually transformed into paint. Higher cause in art burned in Van Gogh with fiery intensity like the sun in many of his paintings, the works were so vital and expressive that it was as if he was trying to work out his demons. As the German artist Otto Dix said, all art is exorcism. Van Gogh certainly approached his work with a religious or otherwise obsessive fervor. These colors give me an extraordinary exultation, he wrote from the south of France in one of many letters to his brother, Theo, who supported Vincent throughout his adult life. The whole earth is glowing under the southern sun. It was around this time, in 1887 or so, that Van Gogh hit his stride. For several years, he had developed his technical skills while, more or less, imitating the styles of Surratt, Cezanne, and other contemporaries who he admired and who pushed the boundaries of art, as he wished to do. Then... Mayer says, in the last few years of his life, he got into the zone and never left, and everything he did in those years are universal treasures. It's remarkable to leaf through the exhibition catalog and see that almost every painting that is instantly recognizable as Van Gogh, even to the untrained eye, is from 1887 to 1890, 
the last three years of his life. This despite his increasing madness that had bedeviled him from childhood when visitors to the family home observed him as a strange boy. Cornelia Homburg, author of the book Van Gogh Up Close, says, There's not a single painting, especially in his mature years, where he didn't know exactly what he was doing. Even if he did three a day, each one was completely calculated, completely worked out in the head beforehand, and was then executed. The next time he would build on what he had done and come up with something new. It's extraordinary. That's what makes him such a great artist. That is a pretty rare thing. Three a day. It defies belief that Van Gogh could complete three paintings, masterpieces that now sell for tens of millions of dollars in a single day, but it's true. Such was the obsessive intensity of his commitment to art and to his glorious vision of nature and changing how we see the world around us. Was his productivity a product of his madness? Yes, but only as an escape from it. In his letters, he wrote letters maniacally, as he did everything else. He said he found it soothing to focus on small details. So it wasn't his mental turmoil that created the art. It was the moments of calm and clarity he found when focused on the fine details of nature, the blessed stillness in a blade of grass or an iris. His work speaks to the emotions of a viewer, says Homburg. It is very rare that people just look and say, oh, what a pretty landscape. Generally, they have an emotional reaction. They feel some of the expressiveness that is in the work that they can actually experience. I've often seen and heard that people break out in tears or get really involved in what they see without necessarily knowing why. That is something that people pick up on and really love. In the end, we're left with conjecture to explain Van Gogh's appeal. Perhaps the assertive self-expression in his paintings appeals to our increased search for individuality in the modern age. Perhaps it's our innate attraction to a spectacular story of greatness from nothing, of masterpieces from a man who popular history tells us, was rewarded only with poverty and disdain. Or perhaps, as Eckstein's writes, the dazzling achievement of Van Gogh was that he made madness beautiful and the untamed decorative. Page 238. A Scandal in Bohemia. An Adventure of the Famous Detective, Sherlock Holmes. Section 1. To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In his eyes, she eclipses the whole of her sex. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world has seen. But as a lover, he would have placed himself in a false position. And yet there was but one woman to him, and that woman was the late Irene Adler. I had seen little of Holmes lately. My marriage had drifted us away from each other. My own complete happiness and Holmes-centered interests were sufficient to absorb all my attention while Holmes remained in our lodgings in Baker Street, buried among his old books, and alternating from week to week between cocaine and ambition. The drowsiness of the drug, and the fierce energy of his own keen nature. He was still, as ever, deeply attracted by the study of crime, and occupied his extraordinary powers of observation in following out those clues, and clearing up those mysteries which had been abandoned as hopeless by the official police. One night, it was on the 20th of March, 1888, I was returning from a journey to a patient when my way led me through Baker Street. As I passed the well-remembered door, I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again and to know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. I rang the bell 
and was shown up to the chamber, which had formerly been in part my own. With hardly a word spoken, but with a kindly eye, he waved me to an armchair. Then he stood before the fire and looked me over in his singular, introspective fashion. Wedlock suits you, he remarked. I think, Watson, that you have put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you. Seven, I answered. Indeed, I should have thought a little more. Just a trifle more, I fancy, Watson. And in practice again, I observe. You did not tell me that you intended to go into harness. Then how do you know? I see it. I deduce it. My dear Holmes, said I, this is too much. It is simplicity itself, said he. If a gentleman walks into my rooms smelling of iodoform and a bulge on the right side of his top hat to show where he has secreted his stethoscope, I must be dull indeed if I do not pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. I could not help laughing at the ease with which he explained his process of deduction. When I hear you give your reasons, I remarked, the thing always appears to me to be so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself, though I am baffled until you explain your process. And yet, I believe that my eyes are as good as yours. Quite so, he answered, throwing himself down into an armchair. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead up from the hall to this room. Frequently? How often? Well, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? How many? I don't know. Quite so. You have not observed. And yet you have seen. That is just my point. Now I know that there are seventeen steps because I have both seen and observed. By the way, since you are interested in these little problems, you may be interested in this. He threw over a sheet of thick, pink-tinted notepaper. It came by the last post, said he. Read it aloud. The note was undated and without either signature or address. There will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted with matters which are of an importance which can hardly be exaggerated. Be in your chamber then at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wear a mask. This is indeed a mystery, I remarked. What do you imagine that it means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. As he spoke, there was the sound of horses' hoofs and grating wheels against the curb, followed by a sharp pull at the bell. Holmes whistled. A slow and heavy step paused immediately outside the door. Then there was a loud and authoritative tap. Come in, said Holmes. A man entered who could hardly have been less than six feet six inches in height, with the chest and limbs of a Hercules. His dress was rich, with a richness which would, in England, be looked upon as akin to bad taste. The deep blue cloak which was thrown over his shoulders was lined with flame-colored silk. He carried a broad-brimmed hat in his hand, while he wore across the upper part of his face a black vizard mask. From the lower part of the face, he appeared to be a man of strong character, with a long, straight chin, suggestive of resolution pushed to the length of obstinacy. You had my note? He asked with a deep, harsh voice and a strongly marked German accent. I told you that I would call. He looked from one to the other of us, as if uncertain which to address. Pray take a seat, said Holmes. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, who is occasionally good enough to help me in my cases. Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as the Count von Kram, a bohemian nobleman. I understand that this gentleman, your friend, is a man of honor and discretion. If not, I should much prefer to communicate with you alone. I rose to go, but Holmes caught me by the wrist. It is both or none, said he. You may say before this gentleman anything which you may say to me. The Count shrugged his broad shoulders. Then I must begin, said he, 
by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years. At the end of that time, the matter will be of no importance. I promise, said Holmes, and I. You will excuse this mask, continued our strange visitor. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you, and I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I was aware of it, said Holmes dryly. The circumstances are of great delicacy, and every precaution has to be taken to quench what might grow to be an immense scandal. To speak plainly, the matter implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. I was also aware of that, murmured Holmes, settling himself down in his armchair and closing his eyes. Our visitor glanced with some apparent surprise at the languid, lound figure of the man who had been depicted to him as the most incisive reasoner in Europe. Holmes slowly reopened his eyes and looked impatiently at his gigantic client. "'If your majesty would condescend to state your case,' he remarked, "'I should be better able to advise you.' The man sprang from his chair and paced up and down the room in uncontrollable agitation. Then, with a gesture of desperation, he tore the mask from his face and hurled it upon the ground. "'You are right,' he cried. "'I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it?' Why, indeed, murmured Holmes. Your Majesty had not spoken before I was aware that I was addressing Wilhelm Gottsreich Sigismund von Ormstein, Grand Duke of Castle Felstein and hereditary King of Bohemia. But you can understand, said our strange visitor, sitting down once more, that I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person, yet I could not confide it to an agent. I have come incognito from Prague, for the purpose of consulting you. Then, pray consult, said Holmes, shutting his eyes once more. The facts are briefly these. Some five years ago, during a lengthy visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress Irene Adler. The name is no doubt familiar to you. Kindly look her up in my index, doctor, murmured Holmes without opening his eyes. For many years he had adopted a system of docketing all paragraphs concerning men and things, so that it was difficult to name a subject or a person on which he could not at once furnish information. Let me see, said Holmes. Hmm. Born in New Jersey in the year 1858. Prima donna, Imperial Opera of Warsaw, yes. Retired from operatic stage. Ha! Living in London, quite so. Your Majesty, as I understand became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so. But how? Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? None. Then I fail to follow your majesty. If this young person should produce her letters for blackmailing or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There's the writing. Pooh, pooh, forgery. My private notepaper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. We were both in the photograph. Oh, dear, that is very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. I was mad. Insane. You have compromised yourself seriously. I was only crown prince then. I was young. I am but thirty now. It must be recovered. We have tried and failed. Your Majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice, burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice, she has been waylaid. There has been no result. No sign of it? Absolutely none. Holmes laughed. <laughs> it is quite a pretty little problem, said he. But a very serious one to me, returned the king reproachfully. Very indeed. And what does she propose to do with the photograph? To ruin me. But how? I am about to be married. So I have heard. To Clotilde Lotman von Saxe-Menningen, second daughter of the king of Scandinavia. You may know the strict principles of her family. 
A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. And Irene Adler threatens to send them the photograph. And she will do it. I know that she will do it. You do not know her, but she has a soul of steel. She has the face of the most beautiful of women and the mind of the most resolute of men. Rather than I should marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. None. You are sure that she has not sent it yet? I am sure. And why? Because she has said that she would send it on the day when the betrothal was publicly proclaimed. That will be next Monday. Oh, then we have three days yet, said Holmes with a yawn. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present? Certainly. You will find me at the Langham, under the name of the Count von Kram. Then I shall drop you a line to let you know how we progress. Pray do so. I shall be all anxiety. Then, as to money? You have carte blanche. And for present expenses? The king took a leather bag from under his cloak and laid it on the table. There are three hundred pounds in gold and seven hundred in notes, he said. Holmes scribbled a receipt upon a sheet of his notebook and handed it to him. And mademoiselle's address, he asked, is Briony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Then good night, your majesty, and I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. And good night, Watson, he added. If you will be good enough to call tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, I should like to chat this little matter over with you. Page 245, Section 2. Dr. Watson continues his story. At three o'clock precisely, I was at Baker Street, but Holmes had not yet returned. The landlady informed me that he had left the house shortly after eight o'clock in the morning. I sat down beside the fire with the intention of awaiting him, however long he might be. It was close upon four before the door opened and a drunken-looking groom, ill-kept, with disreputable clothes, walked into the room. Accustomed as I was to my friend's amazing powers in the use of disguises, I had to look three times before I was certain that it was indeed he. With a nod, he vanished into the bedroom, whence he emerged in five minutes, tweeds suited and respectable. He stretched out his legs in front of the fire and laughed heartily for some minutes, well, <laughs> really, he cried, and then he laughed again until he was obliged to lie back limp and helpless in the chair. What is it? <laughs> it's quite too funny. I am sure you could never guess how I employed my morning or what I ended by doing. Holmes explains that he has spent the morning disguised as a drunken horse groom to spy on Irene Adler at her home. He helps the other grooms working there and chats with them to find out information. They reveal that the beautiful singer leads a quiet life with only one male visitor, the lawyer, Godfrey Norton, who visits every day. Just then, Mr. Norton himself arrives. He stays a short while at Miss Adler's home, then comes out and hires a cab to go first to an office and then to the Church of St. Monica. Holmes is about to follow when Miss Adler comes out and asks a driver to take her to the same destination. In hot pursuit, Holmes follows in another cab. While he's standing at the back of the church observing Norton, Adler, and a priest, Mr. Norton suddenly turns and notices him. He asks the drunken groom to come to the front of the church, since they are in desperate need of a witness. There, the disguised Holmes finds himself in the unlikely role of best man at the wedding of Miss Irene Adler and Mr. Godfrey Norton. This is a very unexpected turn of affairs, said I. And what then? Well, I found my plan seriously menaced. It looked as if the pair might take an immediate departure and so necessitate very prompt measures on my part. At the church door, however, they separated, he driving back to the temple and she to her own house. I shall drive out in the park at five as usual, she said as she left him. I heard no more. They drove away in different directions and I went off to make my own arrangements. Which are? Some cold beef and a glass of beer, he answered, ringing the bell. I have been too busy to think of food and I am likely to be busier still this evening. By the way, doctor, I shall want your cooperation. I shall be delighted. You don't mind breaking the law? 
Not in the least. Nor running a chance of arrest? Not in a good cause. Oh, the cause is excellent. Then I am your man. I was sure that I might rely on you. But what is it you wish? When Mrs. Turner has brought in the tray, I will make it clear to you. Now, he said as he turned hungrily on the simple fare that our landlady had provided, I must discuss it while I eat, for I have not much time. It is nearly five now. In two hours we must be on the scene of action. Madame returns from her drive at seven. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I have already arranged what is to occur. There is only one point on I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may. You understand? I am to be neutral? To do nothing whatever. There will probably be some small unpleasantness. Do not join in it. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. Four or five minutes afterwards, the sitting-room window will open. You are to station yourself close to that open window. Yes, you are to watch me, for I will be visible to you. Yes, and when I raise my hand, so, you will throw into the room what I give you to throw, and will at the same time raise the cry of fire. You quite follow me? Entirely. It is nothing very formidable, he said, taking a long cigar-shaped roll from his pocket. It is an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket. When you raise your cry of fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You may then walk to the end of the street, and I will rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope that I have made myself clear. I am to get near the window, to watch you, and at the signal to throw in this object, then to raise the cry of fire and to await you at the corner of the street. Precisely. Then you may entirely rely on me. That is excellent. It is time that I prepare for the new role I have to play. He disappeared into his bedroom and returned in a few minutes in the character of an amiable and simple-minded clergyman. His black hat, his baggy trousers, his white tie, his sympathetic smile and general look of benevolent curiosity were such as Mr. John Hare alone could have equaled. It was not merely that Holmes changed his costume, his expression, his manner, his very soul seemed to vary with every fresh part that he assumed. The stage lost a fine actor when he became a specialist in crime. Holmes, in his disguise as a clergyman, goes with Watson to Miss Adler's to carry out their plan. The street is animated with groups of jobless men, when Miss Adler arrives, several men start to fight over who will help her down from her carriage. Holmes rushes to her aid and is struck down and appears to lie bleeding in the street. A kindly Miss Adler allows him to be brought into her home and placed on a couch in her sitting room. Holmes motions for her to open the window for some fresh air. Outside, Watson is watching, sees this as the signal, and throws in the smoke rocket, yelling, Fire! he disappears around the corner. Irene Adler, as Holmes had expected, runs for the photo, which is hidden behind a secret panel in the wall near the bell pull. When Holmes cries out that the fire is a false alarm, Miss Adler quickly replaces the photo in its hiding place and runs out of the house. A servant is watching, so Holmes leaves without the photo and rejoins Watson. And now, I asked, our quest is practically finished. I shall call with the king tomorrow and with you. We will be shown into the sitting room to wait for the lady, but it is probable that when she comes, she may find neither us nor the photograph. It might be a satisfaction to his majesty to regain it with his own hands. And when will you call? At eight in the morning. She will not be up so that we shall have a clear field. I must wire to the king without delay. We had reached Baker Street and had stopped at the door. He was searching his pockets for the key when someone passing said, Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. There were several people on the pavement, but the greeting appeared to come from a slim youth in an ulster who had hurried by. I've heard that voice before, said Holmes, staring down the dimly lit street. Now I wonder who the deuce that could have been. I slept at Baker Street that night, and we were engaged upon our toast and coffee in the morning when the King of Bohemia rushed into the room. You have really got it, he cried, 
grasping Sherlock Holmes and looking eagerly into his face. Not yet. But you have hopes? I have hopes. Then come, I am all impatience to be gone. We descended and started off once more for Briony Lodge. Irene Adler is married, remarked Holmes. Married? When? Yesterday. But to whom? To an English lawyer named Norton. But she could not love him? I am in hopes that she does. And why in hopes? Because it would spare your majesty all fear of future annoyance. If the lady loves her husband, she does not love your majesty. If she does not love your majesty, there is no reason why she should interfere with your majesty's plan. It is true. And yet, what a queen she would have made. He relapsed into a moody silence, which was not broken until we drew up in Serpentine Avenue. The door of Briony Lodge was open, and an elderly woman stood upon the steps. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe, said she. I am Mr. Holmes, answered my companion, looking at her with a rather startled gaze. Indeed, my mistress told me that you were likely to call. She left this morning with her husband by the 515 train for the continent. What? Sherlock Holmes staggered back, white with chagrin and surprise. Do you mean that she has left England? Never to return. And the papers? asked the king hoarsely. All is lost. We shall see. He pushed past the servant and rushed into the drawing room, followed by the king and myself. Holmes rushed at the bell pull, tore back a small sliding shutter, and plunging in his hand, pulled out a photograph and a letter. The photograph was of Irene Adler herself in evening dress. The letter was superscribed to Sherlock Holmes, Esquire. My friend tore it open, and we all three read it together. It was dated at midnight of the preceding night, and ran in this way. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. You took me in completely. Until after the alarm of fire, I had not a suspicion. But then I began to think. I had been warned months ago. I had been told that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. And your address had been given me. Yet... You made me reveal what you wanted to know. Even after I became suspicious, I found it hard to think evil of such a dear, kind old clergyman. But, you know, I have been trained as an actress myself. I sent the coachman to watch you, ran upstairs, got into my walking clothes, and came down just as you departed. Well, I followed you to your door. Then I, rather imprudently, wished you good night and started for the temple to see my husband. We both thought the best resource was flight, so you will find the nest empty when you call tomorrow. As to the photograph, your client may rest in peace. I love and am loved by a better man than he. The king may do what he will without hindrance from one whom he has cruelly wronged, I keep it only to preserve a weapon, which will always secure me from any steps which he might take in the future. I leave a photograph which he might care to possess, and I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay, Adler. What a woman! Oh, what a woman! cried the King of Bohemia when we had all three read this epistle. Did I not tell you how quick and resolute she was? Would she not have made an admirable queen? Is it not a pity that she was not on my level? From what I have seen of the lady, she seems indeed to be on a very different level to your majesty, said Holmes coldly. I am sorry that I have not been able to bring your majesty's business to a more successful conclusion. On the contrary, my dear sir, cried the king, nothing could be more successful. I know that her word is inviolate, the photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. I am glad to hear your majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Pray tell me in what way I can reward you. This ring, he slipped an emerald snake ring from his finger and held it out upon the palm of his hand. Your majesty has something which I should value even more highly, said Holmes. You have but to name it. This photograph. The king stared at him in amazement. Irene's photograph, he cried. Certainly, if you wish it. I thank your majesty. 
then there is no more to be done in the matter. I have the honor to wish you a very good morning. He bowed, and turning away without observing the hand which the king had stretched out to him, he set off in my company for his chambers. And that was how a great scandal threatened to affect the kingdom of Bohemia, and how the best plans of Mr. Sherlock Holmes were beaten by a woman's wit. He used to make merry over the cleverness of women, but I have not heard him do it of late. And when he speaks of Irene Adler, or when he refers to her photograph, it is always under the honorable title of The Woman. Chapter 10 Conflict and Reconciliation Page 258 Contrite Makes Right Whether used to repair old, strained relationships or to lay the groundwork for new productive ones, the mighty sorry has proved effective. Apologies are powerful. They resolve conflicts without violence, repair schisms between nations, allow governments to acknowledge the suffering of their citizens, and restore equilibrium to personal relationships. They are an effective way to restore trust and gain respect. They can be a sign of strength, proof that the apologizer has the self-confidence to admit a mistake. Apologies, like so many other communication strategies, begin at home. They are one of a bevy of what some linguists call speech acts and are used to keep relationships on track. Each cultural group has its own customs with regard to conversational formalities, including conventionalized means of repairing disruptions. In the American context, there is ample evidence that women are more inclined to offer an expression of contrition than men. One woman, for example, told me that her husband's resistance to apologizing makes their disputes go on and on. Once, after he forgot to give her a particularly important telephone message, she couldn't get over her anger, not because he had forgotten. She realized anyone can make a mistake, but because he didn't apologize. Had I done something like that, she said, I would have fallen all over myself saying how sorry I was. I felt as though he didn't care. When I asked her husband for his side of the story, he said apologizing would not have repaired the damage. So what good does it do, he wondered. The good it does is cement the relationship. By saying he was sorry and saying it as if he meant it, he would have conveyed that he felt bad about letting her down. Not saying anything sent the opposite message. It implied he didn't care. Showing that you empathize provides the element of contrition, remorse, or repentance that is central to apologies, as does the promise to make amends and not repeat the offense. In the absence of these, why should the wife trust her husband not to do it again? Apologies can be equally powerful in day-to-day -day situations at home and at work. One company manager told me that they were magic bullets. When he admitted to subordinates that he had made a mistake and then expressed remorse, they not only forgave him but became even more loyal. Conversely, when I asked people what most frustrated them in their work lives, co-workers refusing to admit fault was a frequent answer. Given the importance of taking responsibility for the results of our actions, it is distressing when the litigious nature of our society prevents us from doing so. We are, for example, instructed by lawyers and auto insurance companies never to admit fault or say we're sorry following automobile accidents, since this may put us in a precarious legal position. The stance makes sense, but takes a toll spiritually. The power of apologies as a display of caring lies at the heart of the veritable avalanche of them that we are now seeing in the public sphere. Government, for instance, can demonstrate that they care about a group that was wronged, such as when the United States apologized in 1997 to African-American men who were denied treatment for syphilis as part of a 40-year medical experiment that began in the 1930s. Offering an apology to another country is an effective way to lay the groundwork for future cooperation. In the late 1990s, the Czech Republic remained the only European nation with which Germany had not reached a settlement providing restitution for Nazi persecution during World War II. Germany refused to pay Czech victims until the Czechs formally apologized for their post-war expulsion of ethnic Germans from the Sudetenland. In the interest of receiving both reparations and Germany's support for inclusion in NATO, the Czech government offered the apology in 1997 despite the opposition of many of its citizens. The gamble paid off, 
as Germany responded by setting up a philanthropic fund for the benefit of the Czechs. And both NATO and the European Union have invited the Czech Republic to join their ranks. Sometimes it may seem that a nation or group tries to purchase forgiveness with a facile apology. It is absurd, even grotesque, for the leaders of the Khmer Rouge to offer the people of Cambodia brief regrets and immediately suggest that they let bygones be bygones. The statement is woefully inadequate in light of the massive slaughter and suffering the Khmer Rouge caused while it was in power. Furthermore, by taking the initiative in suggesting the past be laid to rest, they seem to be forgiving themselves, something that is not the offender's place to do. Page 268. When one person reaches out with love. The pavements swarmed with onlookers, cordoned off by soldiers and police. The crowd was mostly women, Russian women with hands roughened by hard work, lips untouched by lipstick, and with thin, hunched shoulders which had borne half of the burden of the war. Every one of them must have had a father or a husband, a brother or a son killed by the Germans. They gazed with hatred in the direction from which the column was to appear. At last we saw it. The generals marched at the head, massive chins stuck out, lips folded disdainfully, their whole demeanor meant to show superiority over their plebeian victors. They smell of eau de cologne, the bastards, someone in the crowd said with hatred. The women were clenching their fists. The soldiers and policemen had all they could do to hold them back. All at once, something happened to them. They saw German soldiers, thin, unshaven, wearing dirty, blood-stained bandages, hobbling on crutches or leaning on the shoulders of their comrades. The soldiers walked with their heads down. The street became dead silent. The only sound was the shuffling of boots and the thumping of crutches. Then I saw an elderly woman in broken-down boots push herself forward and touch a policeman's shoulder, saying, let me through. There must have been something about her that made him step aside. She went up to the column, took from inside her coat something wrapped in a colored handkerchief, and unfolded it. It was a crust of black bread. She pushed it awkwardly into the pocket of a soldier, so exhausted that he was tottering on his feet. And now, suddenly, from every side, women were running towards the soldiers, pushing into their hands bread, cigarettes, whatever they had. The soldiers were no longer enemies. They were people. End of CD2. CD2. Mosaic 2 Reading by Brenda Wegman and Mickey Knizovich. Copyright 2013 by the McGraw-Hill Companies Incorporated. No part of this publication may be reproduced or distributed in any form or by any means or stored in a database or retrieval system without the prior written consent of the McGraw-Hill Companies Incorporated, including but not limited to any network or other electronic storage or transmission for broadcast or distance learning. Page 152. The Telltale Heart. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point. 
You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha, would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So, you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on, steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying out, who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done night after night hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney, it is only a mouse crossing the floor. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you 
that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man's dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hastily but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night, suspicion of foul play had been aroused, information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness, until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. 
I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no. No, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart.